This is a video about the completeness of the real numbers. So to start, let's, uh, let's have S be a non-empty subset of the real numbers is what this says. So we're going to have a bunch of definitions here. So number one, so we'll say that S is bounded above if there exists a real number U such that S is less than or equal to U for every single element S of your set, big S. We'll call such a U an upper bound for S. So a particular set can have lots of different upper bounds. So for example, let's look at this set, which is just take the real numbers S that are between zero and one. Well then one is a good upper bound for that set. How come? Well, any number that's in this set S is by definition less than one. So that means that uh, S is less than one for every S in big S. So any number bigger than one would also be an upper bound. So two is a fine upper bound for this set. So is pi, just any real number larger than one would be an upper bound for this set. So sets can have many upper bounds. They don't have to have upper bounds at all. Maybe to go the other way. Let's say S is bounded below if there exists a number W, such that W is smaller than S for every single element S in your set. And uh, we'll call such a W a lower bound for S. So similarly, a set can have lots of different lower bounds. So for example, I'll stick to the set S that are the real numbers between zero and one. And then you guessed it, zero is a fine lower bound for this set because by definition, any real number that's in this set is already bigger than or equal to zero or just bigger than zero really. And so maybe I could put that as a just bigger than. Anyway though, but then negative one is also a fine lower bound for this set. Or so is negative a thousand, just any number to the left of zero would be fine. Okay, so then fine, uh, well not finally, because it's only number three, we'll say that a set S is bounded, so just bounded, not no, no direction included, no upper, no above, I mean, no below. We'll just say S is bounded if it's both bounded above and below. So this set S is gonna be bounded, since one and two in the example showed, one and two here, the examples show that it's bounded above and bounded below. Otherwise, we'll say that a set is unbounded if it doesn't have a lower bound. So if you're like, well, what would be unbounded? Maybe you just think about the whole real line itself. The real line itself is unbounded. And so, yes, my example was that uh, S, the set S we've been playing with, real numbers between 0 and 1, definitely bounded. All right, so lots of different upper bounds, lots of different lower bounds. Now we're going to talk about maybe the least upper bound and then later the greatest lower bound. So let's start with the first one I said. So if S is bounded above, we'll say that a number, a real number U is the supremum. And another word for supremum is the least upper bound of this set S if both of the following happen. So one, your, set, your number U has to be like a legit upper bound of S. And two, if V is any other upper bound of S, then U has to be less than or equal to V. And that is supposed to emphasize that it is the least upper bound that you could find. So let's try to look at this set that we've been playing with, real numbers between zero and one. I claim that the supremum of this set would just be one. So supremum does not have to actually be in your set, just like upper bounds don't have to be in your set. But what I'm saying now is that one would be the smallest number you could take that's larger than every single S in here. And so part of that might be kind of common sense, but one of the hard things about math is to uh, kind of formally prove that. So how would you do it? Well, you're going to always use one and two above here. So part one, if you're an element of S, a big S, then you're definitely less than one all the time. So uh, U equals one is certainly an upper bound. And usually the harder thing to show or to convince yourself of is that it's legitimately the least upper bound. So how I will do that is, let's say V is some other upper bound of S. Now let's say V is actually smaller than one. Let's say V is smaller than this one. Therefore, this can't be the least. All right, well then what would happen then? Well, if V is smaller than one, why don't I measure the distance from V to one? And let's say that that distance is this number epsilon here. So we're just denoting it by epsilon. And then what we're gonna do, well, epsilon some real number. I can cut it in half. And what I could do then is just take V plus epsilon. Now v plus epsilon should be less than 1. So what does that mean then? That tells me that v plus epsilon, it should be one of these s's. So v plus epsilon over 2, sorry is what I meant to say, should be one of these s's, so it's in my set s. But then now what do I have? I have that v is actually less than v plus epsilon over 2, so that v isn't really an upper bound, right? It's not, v is not smaller than every possible little s in big s. 
And so let me try to also draw you a picture here. Anyway, so that tells you that uh, there is no such other upper bound uh, that's larger, that's, sorry, smaller than one. So u equals one is the least upper bound. And how we'll write that to the supremum of a set S, we'll say sup S equals one. To draw you a picture over here, what was I saying? What if you had another upper bound V that was less than one? Then in green, I'm saying measure the distance between V and one. Cut that distance in half, and then look at that orange number. That orange number is still in the red set, but that's to the right of V. So V can't be an upper bound. It's not bigger. V is not bigger than every point in the red set. So one has to be the least upper bound. All right, so let's do the same kind of idea for lower bounds. So let's say S is bounded below. We're going to call a number W the infimum. So that's the fancy word here. Infimum is the same thing as greatest lower bound of S if both of the following happen. So number one, W legit has to be a lower bound of S. And uh, number two, if T is any other lower bound of S, then T has to be less than or equal to W. And again, that emphasizes that W should be the biggest lower bound you could find. So to, to illustrate this concept, the infimum of this set S here should be zero. Zero should be the largest lower bound of this set. So how would you show that? We're just going to try to show one and two here. And again, number one sometimes is a little bit uh, a little bit obvious, not a lot of work there to convince yourself. So by definition of this set S here, um, every single S in this set is larger than zero. Therefore, zero is a lower bound uh, of S. Now number two, we're going to let T be some other lower bound of S. And what we want to show is that T is less than or equal to W. Well, let's see what happens. What if T is greater than or equal to W? Remember, W in my case is zero. Well, same idea. Then what can I do? I can measure the distance between T and zero. That's this here. And I'll just call it epsilon for convenience. And then now what will I do? Well, I could cut that distance epsilon in half, and I could subtract it from T. And I'll draw you in a picture in a moment, but I claim that T minus epsilon over 2 would be a member of this set now, a member of S. But why is that? Uh, good for me, but <laughs> why does that tell me that t can't be a lower bound? Well, t minus epsilon over 2 is a member of my set that is now to the left of t. But t was supposed to be to the left of all members of s, so clearly this inequality that I've highlighted can't happen. So t can't be a lower bound. So therefore, there is no lower bound greater than 0. And so what we would write then, to denote the infimum of a set s, we'll write inf s, and we just said it's equal to 0. If I was to draw you a picture of that little argument there, and maybe, too, when you're proving these things, you probably start with the picture, and then from there try to describe what's happening. So I drew this at 0, 1, and I think that 0 is the farthest left I could go to be, uh, to be the greatest lower bound. Again, it's always hard for me to think about. So what if I had some other one, t? Now what I'm saying is, again, measure the distance from t to 0. Let's call this distance epsilon. If I cut that in half, I get this orange point here. So t minus that epsilon over 2 would be this orange point. And the point then is that now I've found some stuff in my set that's to the left of t. But that contradicts that t itself was supposed to be a lower bound for everything in red. Okay. So what does this bring us to? Now we get to the important part, the completeness property of R. What is the completeness property of R? Every non-empty subset of the reals that has an upper bound has a supremum in R. So R, any, any set that's bounded above, has a supremum in R. So maybe to illustrate why this is such a neat property of the real numbers, let's look at a set that doesn't have this property. So the rationals does not have this property. So one way to see this is, I'm going to use square root of 2, and we all know square root of 2 is not a rational number. You can't write it as a fraction, p over q. Uh, what I'm also going to do, so if you punch square root of 2 in your calculator, you get 1.41, blah, 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 blah. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to make you this set s as follows. I'm going to say one element, and it's 1, and then 1.4, 1.41. And what am I doing? You see that I'm just tacking on extra decimals of this uh, decimal representation is square root of 2. And by the way, like we know that this has no pattern, it doesn't repeat or nothing, so that's uh, in theory, right? This keeps getting bigger and bigger as I go. Um, so in this case, what would be a good upper bound of this set? Well, 1.5 would be a fine upper bound of S, right? 1.5 would be bigger than every single element in my set S here, 
But now the question is, what's the least upper bound of that set? Well, the least upper bound of that set, what do all these numbers want to get close to? They want to get close to the square root of 2. So the supremum of this set would be the square root of 2. It's a little bit hand wavy why I said that, but I think just for illustration purposes, uh, you probably believe me. But uh, what is the importance of this example? The supremum of this set is the square root of 2, but wait a minute. That's not a number that's rational. So what happened then? The supremum is not guaranteed to be rational anymore. So Q is incomplete. So again, up here, the reals are complete. Anytime you have a set that's bounded above, the supremum will still be a real number. It's not going to be from some bigger number system like, say, the complex numbers, say. So in that sense, the reals are complete, whereas the rationals are incomplete.